Today we are talking about five different record sets that you may have forgotten about or maybe even didn't know existed. We're going to get into all of that right now. Just so you'll know, there is a handout uh, for this episode with detailed information and links to all of these record sets in various locations. We'll talk a little bit more about how you can get the handouts later in the show. Okay, so the first record set that I want to talk about is Emigration Records. This is Emigration with an E. These are departure records. So a lot of people are looking for immigration records with an I. Those are when people are arriving. So you actually have two different record sets. You have immigration where people are arriving, immigration with an I, and emigration with an E where people are departing. So you can actually find records in both places. So if you have ancestors who are, you know, migrating from the old country to the new country, then you may be able to find those emigration records in the old country. I have, and boy, was I surprised. Okay, so where do you find these records? I have had most success finding them at the National Archives in the country in which my ancestors departed. So for example, in Denmark, there is a Danish National Archives online where you can go and do research. The trick sometimes is if it's in a different language, it can be challenging. Now, a lot of these websites have, you know, an English version where you can switch to English, um, but not always. So just keep that in mind. You need to have the, at least the country, ideally the town or the village that your ancestor came from. So you might need to back up and do some more research on your family history here in the United States and see if you can flesh out all the records that you can find, anything that you can find to help give you an indication of where they are from. There are a couple great resources online to find those records that are not at the the National Archives where your ancestor came from. One of which uh, is Find My Past. They have a lot of records for people who are moving about. So Find My Past really primarily focuses on the UK and Irish records. But if you come to this page, and again, there's a link in the handout. But if you come to Find My Past and you search the world and you jump down here to immigration and travel, if you'll scroll down, check this out. So learn about these records. So these are people that are traveling to and from the United States and Canada, Ireland, and you can learn a little bit more about these records, which I thought was kind of interesting. Here, check this out. It says the United States was founded by people who were set out to discovered new lands, new opportunities, and a better way of life. Between 1836 and 1914, millions of Europeans migrated to the United States despite the harrowing fact that one in seven travelers died during the transatlantic voyage. That, man, you really got to be wanting to move on. I mean, you got to be, wow. Okay, so they're, you know, at least coming to America and Canada, you know, they're, they're seeking a better life. This is no news to you, I'm sure. I just thought this was really interesting. So you can read through this. You can also see that there was some information here about migrations from Ireland, the United Kingdom, Australia, and New Zealand. So Find My Past has quite a bit of records. You can search for your ancestor up here. <laughs> what really caught my eye was I was digging around and they have New South Wales convict arrivals to Australia. So there is quite a record set for migrants on Find My Past. So check that out. Also, you can find on Ancestry.com a, a quite extensive migration under the immigration and travel section. So if you go to, to the card catalog, right? I'm going to open this up. You have immigration and travel here, but I like to come down here because it shows you a little bit more detail about what is in the record set at Ancestry for immigration and emigration. We have border crossing, citizenship records, crew lists, all kinds of stuff here, even ship pictures. We got a few. So you can see here that they have from all over the world migration records to help find those immigrant ancestors. And if you keyword immigration and hit search, you will get more specific into immigration records. Here's some from Norway. Anyway, just thought that was interesting. So that is a, a set of records that you might want to explore is emigration records 
as opposed to immigration record. All right, the second one that I want to talk about is school yearbooks. Now, you may already know about this one, and if not, fantastic, this is new to you. But the cool part about school yearbooks is a lot of times you can find photographs of your ancestors. This is my grandmother. <laughs> Look at that hairdo. Gotta love it, right? So, yeah, so this was her in Laramie, Wyoming in 1925. Some of these records go back into the late 1800s, which is kind of cool. So here on Ancestry, they have school yearbooks from 1900 to 2016. Hold that thought for a minute because I'm going to show you another record set. So how I got there was you go to search and you drop down to the card catalog, right? I'm just going to do this again here real quick. And then under directories and member lists, then you click into that and then you get to school lists and yearbooks. And then what I do is I search by location. So just kind of depends on what you're doing, which country you're searching in, but then you can search those locations. Now, my heritage also has yearbooks and they have a different record set. So remember at Ancestry, it was 1900 to like 2016. Here we have go back to 1890. While a lot of the records overlap, they have some different countries and stuff. So just be mindful of that. So check this out. Here's the strategy that why you might want to be doing yearbook research. And that is because you might be able to find living people. I did a search for myself and look, there's my goofy self right there. <laughs> so yeah, so you can actually find some of those yearbooks if you are, especially if you're trying to do say DNA cousin research and you're trying to help identify people or where they might be. Try doing yearbook research to help find some of those living people. This is a strategy you might do if you were trying to reach out to a DNA cousin and offer to pay for a DNA test. And how do you find those people? Well, a lot of times we do that on social media and such, but yearbooks is another way to do it. Hey, we're gonna get back to that video here in just a moment, but I wanna let you know that Genealogy TV has a website, a newsletter, and a Facebook page Links for all of that are in the show notes below. All right, let's get back to it. All right, number three is voter lists. Now, you may or may not have run across these voter lists, but these are awesome. They're kind of like city directories. So here, for example, is my great-grandfather. And if I scroll down here, I want to show you just how many. Look at how many I have found. Voter list, voter list, voter list. These are not duplicates, by the way. These are different years. So, for example... If we go, I pulled some of these up already. 1928, here he is, Herman Madsen, living at 3419 South Brighton Avenue. He's a carpenter and he is a Democrat. So it is amazing to me that I can find this stuff. So here's 1928, right? Here's 1930, 1934, 1944. It keeps going, 1946 and so on. So you can find, and you can also see that here he is again. So he's living at the same address all these years. So if you don't have city directories available, this is another way to pinpoint where your ancestor is at a specific time and give you a little bit more information about them. Now, if you're wondering how you can find city directories, go over to the Family Search Wiki, okay? So that's when you get to Family Search, go to Family Search and the Research Wiki, right? Drill into the location. In this case, I'm going to go to, where am I? United States, California. And then over here on the right hand side, if you scroll down, you see voter records. And you can drill into that and it'll give you some more information about where some of these voter records are listed. So in this case, it's showing that Ancestry has some, MyHeritage has some, and so this is another great resource as to figure out where those records are. There are three ways you can get the handouts. Now, the first way is to join the channel membership here at the Information Access Level Channel Membership on the YouTube channel, and then go to the Community tab and you'll find the posts that have the handout links in there. All you have to do is follow the link and download the handouts. Okay. Now the second way is over at Patreon. Now at Patreon, if you're at the happy dance level or higher, uh, you can get the handouts. Those come directly to you in an email. Every time we announce the new video that has a handout with it, 
you'll also get early release with that membership. All right, and then the third way is just to go over to genealogytv.org and click on the handouts tab and you can find all the handouts there for individual purchase. So uh, I hope that was helpful. The handouts really do support the channel and for that, I thank you. All right, we're coming up on number four, but before I get into this, what I want to do is remind you to stick around to number five because it's a really interesting set of records. Okay, so number four is mortality schedules. And again, one of these records that people forget about a lot. So mortality schedules in the United States were created at the time the census was taken every 10 years, but for those who had died, the previous 12 months. So if the census record was on April 1st, so it's going to be from the previous 12 months from April 1st. So just be mindful of that. It's not going to be everybody who died in the past 10 years. It's only going to be those who died in the past 12 months. So these are kind of interesting schedules. And all I did to get here, this is on Ancestry, all I did to get here was to key the word mortality. And so you can see that there are several mortality schedules that pop up. The most popular one is typically the US federal census. Here's one for New York. But there's some interesting little tidbits that I wanna share with you about these mortality schedules. So when you drill in and you do a search, and you find someone, it first pops up looking like this, and it gives you quite a bit of information as to uh, when they died and what they died from. But if you drill in, see now over here, there's no image on this index, but if you look at the suggested records, there is a mortality schedule that matches this woman right here. So drilling into that, I get to this page, and then drilling all the way into this schedule, it looks like this. And so you can actually see in detail some of the information, but let me show you what's really interesting. And by the way, if you can't read some of this faint handwriting, you can pop open the transcription and see it there. I'm going to close this up, but when I was looking at this page earlier, look what I found at the bottom. There is a bunch of notes here. In July and August of 1849, cholera and many deaths occurred. The epidemic, dysentery, and typhoid fever, it goes on to talk about all of this disease that was happening in the area at the time. So you're picking up some history that was written at the time these schedules were taken. So we're getting firsthand knowledge, firsthand history right there on the page. So this is kind of neat. So mortality schedules is another one you should be looking at. Okay, last but not least, number five is the Southern Claims Commission records. Now, why I say not least is because it's actually three sets of records. The Southern Claims Commission records were created in the early 1870s as a way to reimburse those who were Union loyalists to replace uh, goods and property that had been taken during the Civil War. So one of the things that I wanted to point out here was that the states that were affected by this, there was 12 states, Alabama, Arkansas, Florida, Georgia, Louisiana, Mississippi, North Carolina, South Carolina, Tennessee, Texas, Virginia, and West Virginia, all qualified for claims between the 3rd of March, 1871, and the 3rd of March, 1873. The two factors that really came to play was they had to be loyal to the Union during the Civil War and had quartermaster stores or supplies taken by or furnished to the Union Army during the Rebellion. If you have any folks that were on the Union side in the Civil War, then these records may have something for you. And quite frankly, I think it's worth searching anyway, even if you did not have ancestors on the union side, because you never know what you're going to find. There are three sets of records, but there is a master index on ancestry that covers all three. So the three sets of records were claims that were allowed, claims that were disallowed, and claims that were barred. So three sets of records, the disallowed and barred actually come under one set on Ancestry and the allowed is in a different set. So if you search the master index, this is what you might find. So here in this example, you can see the master index shows the status, disallowed, allowed, or barred. So you can see where they're from and the claim number and the year of the claim. And if you can see these, some of these years are after that two-year span. So be thinking about this because this could be 
another set of records that could be important. So if you find someone in the master index and you go and search for them, let's pop over to the Southern Claims Disallowed and Barred. Okay, so if you see the dates here, this is 1871 to 1880. You search for somebody here. At, you could find someone. Here are the allowed index. This is 1871 to 1880 again. And here is what a record might look like. This is an allowed claim. And this is for John S. Knox. This is Culpeper, Virginia. And these are the items that he was claiming were lost during the Civil War. And then scrolling down down you get more information about his loss and this is it turns out to be a 16 year old son who's making this claim on behalf of his father who died before the war so long story short there's more to find here you got the three sets of records make sure you're searching for them they are available on ancestry there are limited records on fold three as well as on family search has some virginia records and the National Archives, everything I found on the National Archives said it had yet to be digitized. So there you have it, five different sets of records and the last being the Southern Claims Commission. I hope that was helpful. If so, please thumbs up and make sure you subscribe. Huge, it's free and it helps the channel grow and it helps you stay informed on the next time we do a video. So there should be more videos on the screen for your binge watching pleasure. We'll catch you in the next one.